We're in this teaching series titled Ministry, Welcome to the Mess. And today we're going to be looking at how Jesus dealt with religious people. And so uh, if you're a religious person, I, hopefully you brought a seatbelt. <laughs> and you can just buckle it up and get ready. Uh, but how did Jesus deal with religious people? Uh, it's interesting, yesterday we had a serve day, a work day here. I'm, I'm so thankful for those that came yeah. and, uh, and, and those that sacrificed your time. And uh, we pulled everything down for Christmas. And, uh, <clears throat> and it was all here and out there. And so now it is all behind me back there. And earlier today, I was reminded, ministry, welcome to the mess. I mean, you can barely get through back there because it is such a mess. But that is, that is ministry. Also, the, the church, the church is made up of people from all different kind of backgrounds. Uh, and ministry is messy when, when you consider all the different backgrounds and all the different views and all the different opinions and all the different traditions Ministry gets, gets quite messy because Jesus prayed in John 17, Lord, may they be one. The prayer for Jesus was unity. When we read through the New Testament letters, Paul's New Testament letters to the church, we see again and again and again a call to unity. Uh, Paul certainly understood that all of these different people making up the church, that it wasn't a building or or, or, or an address or a landmark, it was the people, that there would be all kinds of ideas and all kinds of opinions. And that certainly has rung true throughout the generation since Paul, since Jesus. And so ministry can indeed be, be messy. And so Matthew chapter 15, would you turn Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 15. The main idea today is that is this. Don't settle for religion when Jesus is offering you a relationship. Amen. Oftentimes we, and, and I'm sure if we talked about your past or your upbringing, even your right now, it's possible that there's people that are settling for religion. This is what I know. This is what I'm comfortable with. This is the traditions. And I'm holding on for dear life. But church, I want you to know today that Jesus is offering something so much more and so much better. It's a relationship, a real relationship with him. Amen. Don't settle for religion. When Jesus is offering you a relationship. Look to Matthew chapter 15 in your own Bibles. And if you need a Bible, we have some Bibles in our next step area. Love for you to take one of those printed Bibles and, and own it, read it, mark it up, bring it week after week. But, but read for yourself along with me. Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. When Jesus was approached by Pharisees and scribes from Jerusalem who asked, why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? For they don't wash their hands when they eat. Now, I know many of y'all didn't see this coming, right? I mean, there's a whole lot of things we should approach Jesus uh, about. But uh, the religious leaders of the day, right, approach Jesus after watching the disciples not wash their hands before this meal. This ceremonial washing was commanded by tradition, not by scripture. As we read the text, hear me clearly. These ceremonial hand washing were commanded by traditions, not by scripture. The, the matter in question had nothing to do with good hygiene because especially after COVID, like things changed, right? Now there's hand sanitizer everywhere, or at least there was for the first couple of years. Now slowly it's like disappearing, right? Uh, 
But it was all about, I mean, you had the big stickers. I mean, you couldn't go anywhere without these stickers. And then, I, I mean, we, we knew we had to wash hands as if we didn't know we had to wash hands. <coughs> the matter in question had nothing to do with good hygiene. The religious officials were offended that the disciples did not observe the rigid, extensive rituals for washing their hands. Had nothing to do with good hygiene. Had nothing to do with being a friendly person, a clean person. But it had everything to do with they were offended as they watched and ridiculed Jesus and his followers that they were abiding by the same set of traditions. And so they come to Jesus with this. A Jewish Rabbi Jose once wrote these words. Listen, it's the King James Version. He sinneth as much who eateth with unwashen hands as he that lieth with a harlot. Uh, this, this rabbi in the Jewish culture, they, believe it or not, they put clean hands at uh, the same level as sexual morality. And, and so we look at this text before us and at first glance we would say how ridiculous these people would run to Jesus and approach him about such a matter. I mean, there's certainly other things that we've read through the Gospels that they've approached Jesus, tried to pin Jesus. But unclean hands? Look to verse 3. He answered them. Why do, you, why do you break God's commandment because of your tradition? Now, notice as in the Gospels, as we read through the Gospels, Jesus often responds to questions with a question. We would be wise to learn how to respond as Jesus responded. We, we're a pretty responsive people. We want to make bold statements. We always want to be right. But I love what Jesus does. There's always a teaching moment with Jesus. And so he, he turns their question into a question. Why do you break God's commandment because of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must be put to death. But you say, whoever tells his father or mother, <coughs> whatever benefit you might have received from me is a gift committed to the temple. He does not have to honor his father. In this way, you have nullified the word of God because of your tradition. Well, what's, what's, what's happening here? What kind of response is Jesus responding with? See, some Jewish people of Jesus' day had a way to get around this command. The command to honor your father and mother. They had a, a workaround. If they declared that all their possessions or savings were a gift to God that were especially dedicated to him, they could then say that their resources were unavailable to help their parents. It was a workaround. This is the command of God. This is the word of God. <clears throat> Honor your father and mother. Uh, we, we do the same thing, by the way. I've had countless ask, at what point do I have to stop honoring my father and mother? And I just like take a step back and I'm thinking like at death, I, at death, like that's all I got. You know, I, I, <clears throat> it's the word of the Lord, right? It's the word of the Lord. And, and so the many Jewish people tried to work around. If, if, if I take all my possessions and even though my parents are going to have a time of need, but I've committed them to the Lord's service then there's nothing available for my parents. And this is what Jesus is battling with in this very moment. The religious crowd. Look to verse 7. Hypocrites. 
Isaiah prophesied correctly about you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines, human commands. Uh, Jesus <clears throat> responds to the religious leader's question with a question. Jesus spins the question that you've come to me with, why aren't the disciples abiding by our traditions, our rules, by washing their hands before the meals? And Jesus says, why aren't you honoring the Lord's commands, his word, by honoring your parents? And then he says this word hypocrites. It's an interesting word, this word hypocrites. Uh, in Jesus' day, it had a uh, much more, what, what I would consider powerful meaning uh, than, than what we would consider this day because uh, we kind of just throw, throw the words around. We just throw words around. Well, in Jesus' day, everyone would have known what a hypocrite, who a hypocrite was. Be because uh, in, in the towns, they would have these stages and people would gather at, uh, at the arenas and they would witness a production. They would witness a play. And every person that would take the stage and appear to be someone that they were not were considered hypocrites. I learned that uh, on my second tour of Israel as we're standing on Caesarea Philippi on the stage. I'll never forget that. And so Jesus calls the religious leaders of the day hypocrites. And then he quotes a passage that they would have known. Isaiah chapter 29 verse 13. Scripture says, would you write that reference down? The Lord said, these people approach me with their speeches to honor me with lip service Yet, their hearts are far from me, and human rules direct their worship of me. So Jesus responds with a question. But then he really gets to the, the heart of the matter. No pun intended. The heart of the matter, if you will. <clears throat> we can appear to draw near to God. All the while having our heart far from him. We're, we're actually really good at it. You and I, we're, we're good at appearing that everything is good. Everything is okay. But there's times, moments of our lives that if we're honest, everything's not okay. It's easy to want and be impressed by the image of being near to God without really doing it with our heart. And so the prophet Isaiah was, was so true in his words that oftentimes, if we're not careful, we can honor the Lord with just lip service. We can just say the right things, but not really mean it. it says in verse 9 of 15 Matthew 15 they worship me in vain they worship me in vain teaching as doctrines human commands these traditions have been elevated to the commands of the word of God see God is interested in the in, in, internal and real God's interested in the internal and in real and we are far more interested in the external and the facade. We're far more interested in the external and the facade. I want to encourage you. I want to plead with you today to examine your, your life. To examine your life that, that your relationship with God is not merely external and fake. That it's internal and it's real. Jesus uh, didn't say that all traditions are bad. But he also didn't say that all traditions are good. He, he compared traditions to the word of God. 
and put them at a much lower priority than what God has said. Put them at a much, much lower priority than what God has said. I've been in church my whole life. Uh, uh, e even in my mother's womb, I was in church. <clears throat> I've seen a whole lot of church. Uh, my dad was, is a pastor. Not currently pastoring a church, but for, for the most part, I guess once a pastor, always a pastor. I'll never forget my first ministry position. He was senior pastor. I was his, uh, his youth director. And we were in this very historic church in Florida. And uh, I, I'll never forget, and there was a whole lot of excitement when dad and mom were first called and <clears throat> we were, they were first called to this church. There was a whole lot of excitement, but, but once the church began reaching people and growing, that, that excitement quickly started dissipating. And, and what we came to realize is there was a whole lot of attention and focus and hold onto the history and the historic place rather than the people and the lives that were being changed. And there was a whole lot of hold to the traditions of the past. Now, I might say some things here next that might offend you, but they're not meant to offend you. And, uh, and just so you know, a little disclaimer, I could give or take. Uh, we've made certain decisions here, Discovery, because, uh, well, we planted the church 15 years ago with eight people in our home, and we, there was a lot of freedom with that. <laughs> so, uh, but, but I'll never forget growing up in the church and always wondering, like, who decided to put that American flag there and the Christian flag there? And, and, and it didn't really take me much time to consider uh, that question until someone tried to move the flags. <laughs> like e even the person that put it there had gone in their past. But you better not move the flag. You better not move the flag. Uh, in this historic church, they were proud because in 1960, they had a 50 person choir. And every Sunday, they were bound and determined to have a choir, even though most Sundays there might be three people sitting in the choir loft. But we always had it, so we must continue to. And, and by the way, I, I kind of like you know, choirs from time to time. Certainly not every week because, well, you don't know what goes into it. <laughs> but, but I kind of like some, some excitement, some engagement, you know, we're kind of praying, kind of dreaming, what, what would Easter look like to have a kind of a little choir back there bopping around, you know, I think that would encourage you, you know, es especially if you looked at your face from, from Sunday to Sunday, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, <laughs> no, I love, I, I joke, I'm joking, I'm for the most part, and so, but, but it was like down to three people, but we had to have it, we had we had, we had to have it because we've always had it. I, I, I'm telling you, the traditions of the past, like if you grew up in church, uh, like the, the church church, you know, there was flowers down front and they were fresh and they always were dedicated and committed by somebody's name. And, uh, and, and, but we had to have it and you better not touch them. And, and then the communion table, you know, we had to have it and, and you better not, better not touch it. I mean, traditions, not all bad but not necessarily at times even all, all good. Uh, in this historic church, we had uh, pews. If you've never been to a church with pews, just say thank you to us that we have these <laughs> seats, okay? If you're new to church, you can just say thank you, God. You rescued me from, from that part of my life because after, you know, especially a long-winded pastor, your butt really starts to hurt. And so... Uh, but this historic, one of the first things I noticed I had never seen before was different people's names printed on this little metal thing. And, and when I asked about it, I was told they were called pew placards. I'd never heard of a pew placard. And why does somebody's name need to go on the pew? 
Well, it's because that's where they sat. That was their, that was their row. It was their, it was their tradition. It was their tradition. Listen, uh, not all traditions are bad. Not all traditions are good. Just because we've did something in the past doesn't mean we need to continue to do it. The question is, is God receiving the glory from the church? Is he on the move? Are lives being changed? Are we looking to, to his second coming with great anticipation? Are we making disciples that make disciples? Are we leading people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus? Listen, we have churches that prioritize the baptismal, but not baptisms. We have churches that prioritize buildings, but not people. We have churches that while dying a slow death, prioritize the victories of the past rather than engaging in the battle with the evil one in the present. We have a problem, church, when we start to elevate traditions above the word of God. We better hold tightly to this word of God because there's only one word of God. And just because you have a tradition that you love and I have a tradition that I love, at the end of the day, is it is it in line or is it above this holy word? Because there's only one authority. There's only one thing that over time doesn't change. And it's this holy inspired word of God. Tom Rainer once wrote, when the preferences of the church members are greater than their passion for the gospel, the church is dying. Oh, may, may we always have a laser focused, laser focus on the gospel. May, may we always have a deep commitment to preaching and teaching the gospel. May, may you and I, I I'm not just pre preaching at you, I'm with you. We're in this together. But, but may we always have a focus on the gospel. I, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to, to begin tomorrow. That each day, there might not be a day, one day that goes by that you don't preach the gospel to yourself first. We've been taught to preach the gospel, preach the gospel, preach the gospel. And, uh, and it's a beautiful thing. And we should preach the gospel we were told to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But preach the gospel to yourself. Hey, remind yourself of what Christ Jesus has done for you. When was the last time you just paused and worship and thank God that Jesus came to this earth? He died on a cross. His blood was shed for a wretched sinner like Tim O'Carroll. That although Tim didn't deserve it, Jesus paid it all, that he was placed in a borrowed tomb, and that on that third day he rose victorious. That's what I'm saying. Each day, preach the gospel to yourself, and then go preach the gospel to a lost and dying world. Not all traditions are bad. Not all traditions are, are good. Over these 15 years of discovery, we've had things that we've done. Then we stopped doing them. Believe it or not, then we started doing them. Then we stopped doing them. Then, or we had this thing, and we thought it was the best name, and then we changed the name. And it's like, I'll never forget, I, because I named it, we, we call potluck shindigs, right? Shindigs. <laughs> Thankfully, we don't call them shindigs anymore, you know? I like the word. <laughs> we don't call them shindigs anymore. Not all traditions are bad. Not all traditions are, are, are good. There, there's, some, there's some good traditions, though. There's some good things that we can look forward to, that we can rally alongside of. One of those, the past couple years, we've, we, we, we've held this family meeting. It's tonight at 5 p.m. If you're a partner or, or, or volunteer, you know, you serve in some capacity, and hopefully if you're serving, you're, you're making steps towards partnership. Uh, uh, or if you're interested in really who the church is, what we're really about, 5 p.m. It kicks off tonight, 5 p.m. We've done this the past three years. Are we always going to do it like this? I, I don't know. But it's become a, a tradition. 
but it's something we can come alongside. We can lift up the word of God. We can pray together. We can eat. We can celebrate what God is doing in the different ministries. We can look towards the future. Uh, and then for five minutes, we can, you know, look at a budget for 2025, ask questions, uh, and, and vote on it, and, and, and go home. <laughs> it's the family meeting. It's tonight. We, we have this thing, Next Move. We've called it I, it's 10 different names over 15 years. But Next Move has kind of stuck. But that's become a tradition. And it's the best way we can encourage people to step into this community of faith. And then like two years ago, we said... We're just kind of doing this randomly. Let's put it on the calendar. So people, it kind of becomes a part of our culture. And so the fourth Sunday of every uh, month, Pastor Zach hosts Next Move. It's a 10-minute conversation. By the way, we used to call it a 10-minute after party. <laughs> now we call it Next Move. <laughs> and so not all traditions are bad. Not all traditions are, are, are good. Baby dedications. Baby dedications. Man, what a beautiful thing. Does it, not, does it not just flood your heart with all kinds of emotions when you see a, a, a gift of God and their parents standing up here? Now, we had this tradition for many years that we only did baby dedications on Mother's Day. I can't tell you why, why that was a tradition or a rule. I don't really know that it was necessarily a rule, but it's just what we did for all the years. Do you know this is the first year that... Uh, we added Father's Day, uh, and then a random Sunday in September to, to hold baby dedications. And if there's more babies out there, which I know they're, they're at least they're coming, uh, <laughs> there's, the Lord's doing something in the church. It's crazy. And so uh, we're, we're welcome to not wait till Mother's Day. Uh, but it, it, it was the past, and, and now we're just saying, Lord, we want to celebrate as much as possible. We want the opportunity for our church to pray for the blessing of God on these children and their parents and for us to come alongside of these parents and be an encouragement to, to, these, to these parents. Uh, Christmas Eve Eve. Christmas Eve Eve, the, the last tradition I'll, I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, for, for many years, we were portable. And, and so we, you know, it's, there was challenges that with being a portable church. Uh, but we, we were talking, you know, years ago and we said, man, we need something for Christmas. And, and uh, my wife, was, uh, she, she said, uh, hey, you can do anything you want, but if it's on Christmas Eve, I'm just not going to be there. And I said, okay, well, we probably shouldn't do something on Christmas Eve if you're not going to be there, because that might look weird and, and, and bad. But, um, <laughs> and so a friend of mine uh, in another part of Florida posted, like that same week, posted this, this, this promo of Christmas Eve Eve. And I said, that's brilliant. Like, who, who, who does it matter? Just because it's not Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, like we're, we're celebrating the, the birth of our Savior. Does, does it matter like which day that we do that? And, and so a couple years ago, we just decided, you know what? Christmas Eve Eve is going to be the, 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 the day that we celebrate as a church with candle lighting and all these kind of other traditions, you know, that we can focus our hearts and eyes on the Savior Jesus and we can invite the community to come in. And, and, and so we've had two this year for the first time. We're adding a third and you can reserve your seat, by the way, at wearediscovery.com. 4 p.m., 5.30 p.m. and 7 p.m. We have three Christmas Eve Eves for you to choose. Not all traditions are bad. Not all traditions are necessarily good. In our fight, listen, in our fight to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus, may we not settle for traditions of man instead of the teachings of Jesus. That, that's the heart. That's what I want you to hear most. May we not settle for the traditions of man. But instead, hold tightly to the teachings of Jesus. May we not settle for religion when Jesus is offering a real relationship. Uh, the key to avoid being pharisaical or, or like the religious leaders is to not go beyond what is written. We've, we've already pointed to that. Jesus has already pointed to that. You've chosen traditions above the commands of, of, of the word of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and he says this, Now, brothers and sisters, 
I have applied these things to myself and, Apo and, and Apollos for your benefit. <coughs> so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, nothing beyond what is written. The purpose is that none of you will be arrogant, favoring one person over another. Nothing beyond what is written. If you want to avoid being pharisaical uh, or, or like a hypocrite or, 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 or like the religious in Jesus' day, do not go beyond what is written. Hold tight to this holy inspired word of God. Uh, Shane Pruitt wrote, I can tell you with absolute conviction that lowering biblical standards or attempting to redefine biblical views is never an effective strategy for reaching the next generation with the gospel. He continues to say this. What we must do is teach the Bible as the authoritative word of God. Share the gospel. Love people by kindly yet boldly sharing absolute truth. Be clear about traditional biblical views on sexuality and marriage. And don't make God more tolerant than the Bible does. And he closes by saying this. God doesn't call us to redefine him or redefine the church for people. He calls us to preach repentance and faith so that people will believe and worship God for who he actually is. Look to verse 10 quickly. Summoning the crowd, he told them, listen and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Then <clears throat> the disciples came up and told him, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what, what you said? I, I wonder what was going on in, in, in the disciples' you know, minds. Like, do you think Jesus is going to care that he offended the, the religion? I mean... Of course he was going to offend the religious people, but nevertheless, verse 13, he replied, every plant that my heavenly father didn't plant will be uprooted. Leave them alone. Do you see that in verse 14? Leave, Jesus tells them, leave them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind guide the blind, both will fall into a pit. There's another message in here, and you better be very careful who you allow to speak into your life, who you allow to influence your life, who you allow to lead and guide your, your life. You better be careful who you are getting counsel from. You, you, you better be careful. Jesus says, and if the blind guide the blind, both will fall into a pit. Verse 15, then Peter said, Explain this parable to us. Do you still lack understanding? I, I mean, poor Peter. It's always Peter. Right? Do you still lack understanding, he asked. <laughs> Don't you realize that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and this defiles a person. Listen to verse 19. For from the heart, for from the heart, where? The heart. Come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual moralities, thefts, false testimonies, slander. These, verse 20, these are the things that defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile a person. So Jesus, full circle, comes back around. He comes back around full circle to finally answer the question that Matthew 15 opens with. These things defile a person, not unwashed hands. Verse 19, we, we see that it's from the heart. And, and so we, we would be wise, all of us, starting with me, to protect our hearts. We, we, we would be wise to guard our hearts. Uh, Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, guard your heart above all else. Guard your heart above all else for it is the source of life. 
How do I not fall into theft? How do I not fall into sexual immorality? How do I not fall into slander? How, how do I not fall into murder? I mean, all of these things across the board. How do I not sin against God? By guarding my heart. Guarding my heart above all else. Look to Matthew 16 as we close. Matthew 16, verse, verse 1. Matthew 16, verse 1 as we close. The Pharisees and Sadducees approached and tested him, asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when heaven comes, you say it will be good weather because the sky is red. And in the morning, today will be stormy because the sky is red and threatening. Yet you know how to read the appearance of the sky, but you can't read the signs of the times. You have all this knowledge, but you don't know what the Lord is really doing. An evil, verse 4, an evil and adulterous generation demands a sign. Demands a sign. Give me a sign, God. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. If you've never read the story of Jonah, I encourage you to take time this afternoon. Read through it. You can't outrun God. There's a calling on your life. God will get your attention one way or another. And ultimately, the message is still the same. Repent. <laughs> then he left them and went away. Verse 5. The disciples reached the other shore, and they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus told him, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. The, the leaven. Galatians chapter 5, verse 9, Paul writes to the church in Galatia, he says, a little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough. And so what Jesus is getting after is you got to be careful. you got to be careful that you don't think the enemy's creeping all, all, all kinds of ways, creeping in all kinds of ways, uh, wants, you to, wants to take you out. He's like a thief who's come to steal, kill, and destroy. He, he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Uh, 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 we, we, we see the call to the church to be on guard because the evil one is creeping in unannounced, un unaware. We better be careful. That's not just a call to the, the church at large, but, but in your, your home. That's a call. We better consider our lives. Is there any area of our life that's not honoring to the Lord? That's not pleasing to him? Is there any wicked way within me? Is there any sin, even the smallest of sin? They were discussing among themselves, we didn't bring any bread. Aware of this, Jesus said, you have little faith. Why are you discussing among yourselves what you do not uh, have that you do not have bread. Don't you understand yet? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you collected? Or seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many ba large baskets you collected? Why is it you don't understand that when I told you beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, it wasn't about bread? Verse 12. Then they understood that he had not told them to, be, to beware of the leaven and bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Church, as, as we close the day, I want to I call you to ask the Lord to reveal any area of your life, any area of your life that that you have put uh, religion or tradition above the teachings of God. Reveal any area of your life. If there's any sin that's present in your life, anything that's hindering you from being as close to Jesus as possible, would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place and online? For a moment, would you just get alone with the living God? And would you just say this simple prayer? Lord, right now, I want to encounter you. <laughs> would, would you take it one step further? Lord, right now, 
I need to encounter you. I need to encounter you. Lord, reveal any wicked way within me. Is there anything in your life that's not pleasing to him? Would you ask him to reveal it to you? Would you surrender it over to him? As people are praying all across this place, perhaps there's one that you would say, I've yet to surrender my life over to Jesus. But right here, right now, there's a stirring in my heart and my life. And I know what I need to do. Is say yes to the Lord Jesus. As people are praying all across this place and online, if that's you, would you say yes to Jesus? Hey, something like, dear Jesus, I... I am a sinner, and you are the Savior. I trust in you completely. Forgive me of all my sins. I believe you came to this earth. You died on a cross, and you rose victorious for me. And so today, I surrender my life over to you. Have your way. Have your way in me. Thank you for saving me. If that's your prayer, would you thank him for saving you? All across this place, would you thank him for saving you? Maybe there's some here today that you've strayed and today would be the day that you come home and you recommit to following Jesus. You, you, you recommit to knowing his word, holding tightly to his word. What is your decision today? Father, in these in these remainder, uh, remaining moments, in these remaining moments, oh God, have your way. Have your way. Lord, do what you need to do within us. If, if some have found themselves just in a comfortable place, oh God, as much as we don't want it, <laughs> shake us up. Lord, if, if some have, are questioning you, Father, I pray that you would make yourself more known than you ever have before. If some are struggling with sin, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring the conviction that would lead to change. Lord, that they would surrender whatever it is that they've given into the evil one and they would choose you. Choose to honor you with their lives. And, and so God, we thank you. Whatever next steps are needed to take so that we continue to be people of great faith. God, help us. We ask this in the name of Jesus and Jesus alone.